I'd like to call the meeting to order. And I'd like to welcome you to the 2021 summer member event. We would have loved to have done a tour, but you know, that virus just got in the way. And while the event is being held virtually, our annual conference and meeting um, and next year's summer tour will be held face to face. Yay! I'm Mary Texer. I'm the MOD president for 2021. And while this has been a virtual year, it has been an extremely busy one for you um, as your board has worked to serve you, the MOD members. The first item on the agenda is the strategic plan. Emily, if you want to show the next slide, please. The lead author on the first two strategic plans was Craig Leiser. And it's, um, I'm very sorry to have to tell you that Craig passed this last Sunday. He was truly a force of nature and he was filled with great ideas and energy and he will be missed. Um, I'm gonna miss his help on this next strategic plan. Um, your mod board, when we heard that he was in failing health, gave him a lifetime achievement award in recognition for service to the Minnesota Association of Watershed Districts through membership on the mod board of directors, leading the initial strategic plan effort, serving on the board's restructuring team, serving on the governance committee, which updated the mod bylaws and drafted the first board manual of policies and procedures, and for continu a continual upbeat spirit and leadership skills that always encouraged and inspired. So Craig, we will miss you. Um, if you're interested, his service is on Saturday. And if you Google Craig Leiser, it will come up in Google. So in addition to preparing the update, the Strategic Planning Committee will be coming to you at the annual meeting to get your ideas for where MOD should be headed in the 2023 through 25 years. So start imagining now, we need your visions. At this point, Emily Javins, MOD's Executive Director will share where we are today. Emily? Thank you, Mary. Thank you, Mary. Um, is that feedback? Okay, sounded like there was, but it sounds like now we're okay. So um, we're going to go through, we're going to reacquaint ourselves with the current plan, review the accomplishments that we have to date, consider the work that's left to be done, and then talk a little bit about the next uh, three-year cycle, the planning effort there. So just uh, going back a little bit, uh, the, the uh, organization was formed in August of 1971, which when I put the slide together, I realized, oh, that was 50 years ago. We, uh, I wish I would have noticed that a little bit sooner. Uh, we could have, we uh, may need to think about how we're gonna celebrate 50 years here, but we could still get it done. On the purpose at the time was to capitalize on the combined knowledge of watersheds. And in this, uh, this is our second strategic plan. And we added core values this time. And those are to act with integrity, communicate and collaborate effectively and stay relevant and science-based. And I think of those five, I think the one that really just, uh, is the most representative of us is the collaboration. It, we're, we're collaborating and maximizing all partnerships. So the mission and vision is that we advocate and establish MOD as the leading resource and advocate on watershed management. And in the strategic plan, we broke it up into three, uh, three areas, education and training, communication and collaboration, lobbying and advocacy. So we're gonna go through each of those sections of the plan. So education and training, the purpose is so that we can uh, connect members with the training that they need so that they can do the best job they can to influence the restoration and protection of Minnesota's water resources. We identified three key audiences, and those were the managers, the administrators, and staff. And the governance structure on this to make sure that we are um, including all of our all of our members and getting input from all three regions across the state and all different kinds of members, the managers, administrators, staff. Um, we do have a committee that looks at the education plan and we, um, it's been sitting there, but we just uh, got it launched uh, last month. So that, that's good, we're on our way there. We did have uh, in 2018, the, uh, some of the MAWA, if you're not familiar with that, that's the Minnesota Association of Watershed Administrators. And uh, I think three or four of us, plus me, we, we sat in the Riley Purgatory office and uh, 
uh, whiteboarded it all up and everything and came up with this one page plan here about what we what we would make sure that we tried to do before this plan ended. And we're going to go through those seven items. And then if you'll notice at the bottom, if you can, if you have a screen that's big enough, we had some ideas that we knew we couldn't start right away, but we wanted to make sure we got it on the list for future. And that was supposed to be, you know, 2020 or longer. And I'm happy to say that two of those of the three, um, we are well on our way doing that. So we'll hear more about that. Uh, so number one, uh, create an inventory track delivery of needed training. We did that uh, for one solid year where every single training uh, possibility that we saw, we, we logged it, put an abstract, if there was a description of the class, who offered it, how much it was, um, did that. And we definitely were convinced that we have a, mo a lot of, almost a lot, a lot of the training that we needed was out there. We just needed to connect everyone with, with those resources. And so the next step is to, um, of course, keep the, the inventory up to date. So we will be looking to do that um, before the year is over to make sure that we have a complete list. And this is the list that we started with, and we grouped it at the time by the different types of uh, learning that folks would need. And this came from two different resources. There was an administrator survey that was completed in 2017. And the year before, we contracted with Cliff Eichinger to do, um, to do a survey and put together quite an exhaustive uh, report. Um, I think it's over 100 pages, actually, of where there's resources and whatnot. So uh, we grabbed, we looked at all the topics through those, put together this list, what the education committee is doing right now is looking at these topics and then defining them by role. So what do the managers need to know out of this list and what do administrators need? And I think that's the next step. And what I'm hoping to do is later this year, uh, we'll send out that list and as managers or as administrators, take a look at that. And when you see a list of the things that we think managers should, what should need to know, is there anything missing? So take a uh, watch out for that and uh, give us some input. And you can always, um, if you have some ideas and it's not on this list, uh, let us know. We'll just add it just to keep track of these ideas. The second item is that we knew we needed to increase communication with Bowser uh, because we didn't feel we were uh, getting the training that we needed from them. And so what have we done since we put this on paper? We have met every year with staff to talk about Bowser Academy. We're slowly, I, I'm not sure how much progress we're making on that to really cater that training of more to be more applicable to uh, watersheds. Uh, but we did last year, we did an internal survey that we sent out asking uh, the people that did attend the academy, was it focused on watersheds, was it helpful, and we did provide that with, with Bowser, that feedback. We also, there were a number of training sessions that were originally created specifically for SWCD. And that was due to a grant that came from the federal government. But some of them were very applicable to us. Uh, like for instance, um, Hydrology 101. And originally we weren't invited to attend those. And then we got a little bit of traction and they said, well, you can attend it if there's empty seats, we'll let you know the day before. Well, that's not particularly helpful for a out of town all day training. But now we do have um, the ability to, if we need, want to go to those classes, and they've been in place now for, us, for several years that we can, we can attend those. So that, that was a, a, a good improvement. And uh, just recently at a re one of the regional meetings, uh, Bowser uh, mentioned that they were interested in doing some manager training regionally. So uh, just this week, I did talk to Kevin Pagalki um, about that and just making sure that we coordinate um, that with what are we gonna teach during our, our new manager training or our basic watershed management class at our conference. And I've also chatted with uh, Leanne Buck from the Soil and Water Association, uh, making sure that we can you know, do joint training when we can and just not overlap each other because there's, there's enough training topics to go around all the people who are gonna do training. Let's see if we can just really nail it and have a spot for every type of training that you have. And the next steps is just to keep working, uh, just to keep working with Bowser and uh, seeing what we can, 
what we can do to get more training out there and for to have them help us. Um, another, this is a key point of our education program, and this is to work with as many other people uh, to trill our to fill our training gaps. Um, a couple of years ago, we did hold that joint conference with the Soil and Water Association. Well attended, uh, got great feedback. Uh, it was a governance 101. They do that every other year when they have new uh, um, board members elected. And so this would be the year, Leanne and I talked about it and uh, we're gonna skip it this year, but it will come back. Um, we did, I have met with a training coordinator for the Association of Minnesota Counties, and they um, absolutely would love to have us join those. And the beauty of attending an AMC workshop is that you are going to be sitting with some county commissioners. And sometimes, you know, we have that friction with, with county commissioners who appoint us or give us grief about something or other. But I think whenever we can meet with our, our partners or anyone where there might be tension, um, that's that's just of course, uh, the best thing. And then you, you start forming those relationships and it's easy to call each other up. Um, I guess we already mentioned that one. And then uh, the insurance trust companies, um, most of the watersheds I think do use the League of Minnesota Cities Insurance Trust, but some use the, the Minnesota counties one um, to offer training, but they have wonderful training topics on risk management. So how can you get yourself in trouble? So they do data practices things. Um, uh, if you're when you're doing interviews, make sure that you know that you're well versed in what you can and cannot say. Those type of trainings, and we brought them in um, a couple years ago uh, to do one of our trainings. So that was that was really helpful. The training really dropped off, of course, uh, with COVID, and so um, the next step is to reconnect with all of those partners and get back on their mailing list and and just renew those those partnerships. New thing, uh, let's see, notify members of upcoming training opportunities. So we do that in several locations. We do highlight trainings on social media. We do uh, try to highlight them in our newsletters each time we send out a newsletter. And we just put in on our website a training calendar. So here's a screenshot of what the training calendar is. Um, and you can click on any of those and it'll pull up a description of the training. So we're gonna keep, we're gonna continue this work um, here is an example of uh, the Facebook post, and this one is next week. This looks like a good one. Uh, uh, Tim Dries brought this to our attention. There's going to be a, an edge of field um, practices for achieving water quality goals. It's a one hour on Zoom. It, there's no charge. And the lower, uh, the lower uh, screenshot there uh, in the, on the lower side of the slide, that is what you would see if you clicked on our calendar. And, and looked for that. So there's a, a link to get right there. And so keep an eye on those. Um, let's see, the next item, number five, uh, facilitate sharing of knowledge between districts. So this is the, you know, the networking opportunities that can be set up. And a few years ago, Riley Purgatory Bluff Creek and um, a Pelican River, they did a, an actual exchange retreat where they went to each other's offices and just learned from each other. And it sounded like a, a fantastic opportunity. And we will, um, that is one where um, we may, we probably need to reconsider this if we want to, you know, be the one that is going to promote that, or if maybe perhaps that's a better fit for the administrators group. But we do absolutely try to provide ample networking breaks at MOD events. And I will say the biggest surprise at our online conference last year was how many people commented on the fun they had networking with each other. And you could do that in little private uh, in private rooms or just through the chat. And, and people were almost just giddy because even though we couldn't see each other, people were still connecting with people that they hadn't connected with for a long time. So even during COVID, we still got some networking in. Promote minimum training standards. Uh, we just talked about that a little bit. You know, what does a manager uh, need to know? And Bowser did complete a tool that would put together an individual development plan for managers and staff. So you would list out the, the training goals you had, and then when you completed it, uh, you'd mark that and whatnot. And, and that was um, a 
as part of the grant they got to get more people trained um, in the soil and water offices to, to be able to design practices, but the, the system and the tool is already set up. So we are working with them to see how we could just, uh, if it needed much modification and that we could bring that over for us so that we could track uh, training for our members, um, that they'd have a, a tool to be able to track that. So the education committee is uh, going to keep working on defining those learning objectives. Um, and then uh, we'll work with Bowser, see how that goes. And, uh, and of course, continue to work with partners to minimize overlap of training. And number seven, increase the number of training opportunities available to members. So this was, I would say this, is, this was a big accomplishment. For the 2020 convention, we offered more sessions than any other year that we had done. Usually our rooms and our schedule can only hold 24 presentations. But because we were on an online setting and we scheduled the day a little differently, uh, we had 33. And we were the only local government association to do a full online convention that did training. Uh, so, I, and it was interesting to me that uh, that was even a consideration when we were going to do an online one. I just there was no question we have to offer training. So, so I think we we uh, invested our resources well there. Um, let's see. Oh, and we did two because we were gonna go online, we knew that that was gonna have its own set of challenges. And we, we hired one instructor to talk about how you do a good online training. What does your lighting have to be? What kind of sound do you have to have? How do you, all those little things you don't think of. And so we provided that to all our presenters that training and then Bowser helped us out um, about just how to put together a good presentation, kind of the basics of, of PowerPoint, things like that. I'm breaking pretty much all the rules um, of that she taught us, so I apologize for that. These slides are not the prettiest, uh, but they the content, the content is decent. I, I there's kind of a rule of thumb that for every minute you speak, it takes a, an hour to put together a presentation for every minute. And I just didn't quite have that much time to make this to be a beautiful, beautiful presentation, but hopefully you can put up with all the wordy slides. And at the 2021 legislative briefing, that is, we held training there too. And that was for the first time, uh, Cedar River Watershed District helped us out there to tell us all the ways that they connect with their legislators, connect with the public. And that, went, that was a training that folks really loved. It was recorded and available on our website. So we will just continue to work on building on these accomplishments. And I think it's important to note that this round of the strategic plan started January 2020. So a lot of a lot of the goals and, and things that we set, um, maybe, you know, we did a pretty good job meeting them, but some of them kind of slowed down a little bit just because of logistics. But we're uh, gaining back speed, that's for sure. So here was two new ones that was that were identified for further out. And that was the first one was create an online training library for 24 seven access to training. So here's a screenshot of our online library page and the website address. It's just our website online dash library. And you can go into either one of those items in blue there and find those presentations. The one that we did at the legislative event is that second one, how to effectively communicate with your legislators and utilize constructive outreach strategies. So if you didn't see that one, I highly recommend it. And we also um, developed an introductory workshop on drainage law uh, when for the last convention, that was one of our pre-conference workshops. And that is archived um, in an online drainage library too. Um, so I, I'll have to get you the link on that one. So we're gonna continue building this library. I guess I should mention the other pre-conference workshop that we did last year was specifically focused on funding, mechanisms of funding that were not just the general levy. Um, we've, had, we've struggled with getting the general levy increased. And so instead of, well, I guess we saw it as an opportunity to discuss all the other ways that you could possibly fund your work without, without the ability to raise the levy past 250,000. 
The mod handbook, we are that a goal was to update that and transition it to a wiki format, which we said at the time, but wiki is going away. So we'll have to adjust that goal. Um, the idea was that it could be a little bit more searchable and you could uh, click on a link and, and move around it a little bit easier than just one large PDF. So Mawa uh, is the one taking the lead on that. Uh, I just met with them this morning for just a, a brief amount of time. They meet monthly and they are crushing it. They have acknowledged that it's a little bit bigger lift than they thought. Um, we were hoping, uh, originally we thought, oh, we can get that done by the conference and we can do lunch and learns ahead of time, but it is a bigger task. Uh, so we're, we're a little bit pushed back on that, but um, it's, it's, they're doing great work. And so a huge thank you to them. We will put that under a attorney, an attorney review when it's done in 2022 launch it on our website and have some training about how to use it and, and let people know uh, what is in that book. So in summary for education, we were able to offer more training sessions in 2020 dis despite COVID. We stre strengthened our governance structure by launching the education committee, partnered with organizations, set up a training calendar. Um, we now have 24 access to some training. So overall, I'm just going to read this sentence at the end. We enhance our education program through collaborations, innovative solutions, and our commitment to members. Next, we have the second section of our strategic plan focused on communication and collaboration. Um, the purpose uh, keep keep you informed of what's going on in the watershed world, facilitate collaboration between us, sharing information, keep you up to date about what we're doing. Um, we didn't necessarily have objectives or key audiences identified for this one, but there were priorities that were specifically uh, listed and we're going to go through those. The governance structure, we don't have a communications committee per se, but the strategic plan committee just uh, met the last month or so, and they are working on a communication strategy to identify the types of communication we're going to do, the audience, the messages. So um, stay tuned for that. We'll be working on that uh, over several months here. So the first item was to continue social media efforts to increase visibility and impact. So we post at least two times a week. Um, Maddie Bone is the one who works on that. And then she analyzes the reach that we had, the impact, which articles are gaining traction, which ones are getting shared. And one of the ways that we know we can increase our reach is when we repost stories from partner agencies. So this one, uh, this one is, is a fun one. This was uh, July 13th from Renville County SWCD. There is this uh, experiment that is being promoted among the SWCDs to soil your undies. Uh, sounds funny, but if, uh, so what you do is you plant a pair of underwear and then dig it up later. And if the microbial action is really good, that will, it will decompose that everything except elastic. So this is their, this is a promotion that the soil and waters are doing. I believe it's nationwide um, to really talk about soil health and what makes soil work. Here is uh, another one that we were able to promote. This is cross promotion, but also recognizing the work that one of our watershed districts is doing. This is Waterfest. Ramsey Washington Metro uh, puts this together every year. And you'll see down here, uh, when I open up the Facebook page or when Maddie does, we get more information. So here on this one, 114 people were reached. There were eight engagements, meaning they interacted with it. They clicked on it or something. And, and this was a 2.6 times higher than um, what we, how we usually see um, the distribution of the statistics. So we now recognize this was a good one. How can we do more like this? So that's just an example of, so you know what's happening behind the scenes. Um, educating the public about the work of watershed organizations. We usually do this on social media is probably the biggest way we do. And that has two benefits. We learn from each other about what we're doing and the members of the public who follow us also get to see that. 
And we can also point to it, you know, if somebody asks, well, what do watersheds do? Maybe it's a legislator or, you know, we can send them to our Facebook page and then they can start to see uh, stories. So it's a good place, good place to send people. Here was uh, one from June 30th. Uh, from Coon Creek. They have a video, it's a video actually of the Middle Sand Creek uh, corridor restoration as a time lapse uh, video. And then the one on the right uh, was also in June um, where Capital Region Watershed District won an award. And that is a picture of uh, one of the interactive uh, displays outside the outside of the office. Increase member communications about the lobbying work we're doing. So uh, accomplishments, we have continued those video updates uh, that Ray started doing. Uh, every, every time the Bowser board meets, I attend those and am, am on the agenda to give an update and we continue to do that. Uh, we are by far the most regular um, association that gives updates. And uh, you should have noticed this last, this within the last few months, we starting in January, started sending out communications in a newsletter format. And we are, it, it's kind of on about a twice a month, we send things out and try to hit the different areas of service that we provide. And hopefully you're finding those useful. You'll probably continue to see some changes about how we organize that just until we find uh, exactly the best format and whatnot. So that's been fun. Next steps is to bring back our written legislative updates. I've done that in years past, um, and apparently people found those very helpful. I wasn't really sure, I didn't get a lot of feedback on it, and um, it takes a lot of time to do those, but um, it's, it's worth it. And uh, so look for those uh, coming back. Incre oh, also, here's some other things that we have done on the same number three increased communication about what we're doing, our legislative and state agency lobbying. So this year, uh, because of COVID, uh, John Jasky and I set up a weekly uh, recurring meeting on our calendar and we, we chat every single week. And with a new DNR commissioner, uh, she has set up quarterly meetings uh, with us, which has never happened before. Those have been just fantastic. It's her and her one or two assistant commissioners. And then uh, we wrote a letter with the counties and the soil and water to the Clean Water Council that, uh, that got some attention and traction. And as a result of that, the commissioners who all get clean water funding decided it was probably important that they meet with their local partners. Um, we were a little bit critical. Um, and so that has been fantastic. We are meeting about twice a year with all of them. We're talking the, the PFA, MPCA, the Department of Ag, DNR, Bowser, Met Council. It's a, it's a large group of, and it's the top, the top dogs there. So we have really found that useful. Um, next steps, continue these, um, our circle of influence here. And like with the DNR, we identified some issues that we could work on with them. And we'll be breaking into small groups to work on a few of those. Increase accessibility to the, some of our, uh, our governance documents. Those are all on the website. And uh, we'd like you to know too that the board adopted, formally adopted a policy regarding the openness of our meetings. So any board member is, or any, excuse me, any member is welcome to join our board of directors meetings. And there is now an item on our agenda for member comment period. And you have five minutes to address that. And also with committee meetings, you're allowed to attend those also. And we have a new, uh, section on our website that has all of these meetings listed. So I have a couple of them uh, listed on the screen here. They were also on your agenda. Sharing updates from our big, our biggest uh, state level groups, and that would be, you know, Bowser, Drainage Work Group, Clean Water Council, Local Government Water Roundtable. 
So we did just in our last newsletter, you would have seen a update from the last Bowser meeting. And we, I have one ready to go for the drainage work group for our next meeting. And we are gonna get all of these um, in a routine and scheduled to make sure that we get you those updates. So here's what that last one looked like. So of the things that they talked about at the Bowser board meeting, we've got the highlights here. Um, and this, this was nice. It actually, I had uh, several people reach out and ask me a couple of questions about what was, what was going on with a couple of the items. And, and so that was, that was good. I knew uh, people were reading those and found those helpful. Just in the bottom left corner, that happens to be a map showing compliance with the buffer law over time. And then the drought monitor, which looks a lot worse now, those are from uh, June 17th and June 24th. But um, so hopefully you find those uh, useful and we'll keep uh, producing those and making them available to you. Brochures and fact sheets, uh, that's a goal. We are, uh, we've are. we talked a few times at the Board of Directors looking at redoing this uh, Watershed District guidebook. If you have seen that before, there's some introductory pages that talk about watershed management, watershed governance, and then each watershed district has two pages, you know, like side by side and talks about what their organization does, the board members, different things. So you fill it all out and then we put them all together in a book. And this will be available electronically. If we publish some in hard copy, that'll be too determined. But fact sheets, we definitely need to uh, work on producing some more fact sheets. It's great if you have some on a topic already, if we can start with those. I remember Rice Creek a few years ago had one that they were using for a legislative issue. We just, we just made some minor little tweaks through our logo on it and we were able to distribute that uh, legislatively. So here's an example of one. This is a Bowser, uh, Bowser one that uh, probably needs to be updated. I think, um, yeah, they still have Ray's address um, for the Minnesota Association of Watershed Districts address. So this is a few years back, but uh, things like this. Uh, so if you have an interest or really love fact sheets and wanna do that, uh, let, let me know. We can definitely put you to work. And then establishing regions one and two with regular meetings. Metro, the, in the Metro, they have been meeting quarterly for, I think I heard at one of the previous meetings, 20 years. They meet four times a year. It was actually Tuesday night was our last one. And now region one has met. They met not a month or a month and a half ago, maybe. And region two, they are going to consider it. They are going to add it to their agenda at the annual conference to discuss it. So I think that's perfect. So our, communicate, our communication summary here, we've increased the way we communicate. We've strengthened um, what we are, strengthened our governance through having a communication strategy. We continue to enhance the input that we want and are getting from you. The communication with state agencies has never been this strong, which is fantastic because we definitely need them in our court. And we're coordinating with partners more and more all the time. So in summary, we've, we've enhanced our communication through technology, additional governance, strengthened partnerships, and greater transparency. Last, the last area here is uh, lobbying and advocacy. And um, again, the, the objective is to promote MOD as a leadership organization. And the governance structure, we have, there's two committees that actually work with this. The Resolutions Policy Committee oversees the resolutions process, which we're gonna talk about later. And then the Legislative Committee recommends a platform for the MOD board. And just wanna take a minute to recognize those chairs, uh, Sherry Davis-White and Jackie Anderson. And that Legislative Committee just, uh, just got started a few years ago. The resolutions has been around for a long time, but this is a way that we, identify issues and then uh, work on them. Increase the effectiveness of our platform. So what have we done? We launched the committee. We, this just this year, we added a little bit more rigor to our resolutions process. And you will, you'll hear about that later too, asking a few more questions specifically, what have you done to work on this issue already? And, and asking for greater descriptions, things like that. And there, I, you have to know, and Ray will talk about this a little bit more too, 
there were very few policy bills in any category of our government that were passed this year. Um, and the good news is that we stayed on top of pending legislation that may have not been good for us. And, and we held our ground, nothing bad happened. We, we, we didn't get policy bills um, passed, but uh, really not many people did. But Ray will give you a full update on that. And next steps um, is to work with the legislative committee, engage them a little bit more um, on creating handouts and engaging the members. So um, one step at a time, we've got the platform, the process to, a, to recommend a platform to the board solidly in place. And now we can engage that committee a little bit more. So I just want to throw up um, from 2019, this was the platform that we had. We had way too many items on our platform, but because we had been working on so many of these issues for so many years previously, and it, it things just came together and we got 11 out of 18 of our issues passed. So that was 2019, 2020 and 2021, of course, were COVID only online meetings, only you know to be able to talk to anybody. In 2020, though, we were able to get two of the issues that were not passed, and then two of them just kind of fell off the radar, and they're not really issues anymore. Out of the list from 2019 on an overly ambitious uh, platform, we still have left increasing the tax levy, that limited liability for SALT applicators. That is still, I tell you, they are still working on that, but there is resistance there that seems to be very strong. Um, no matter how hard we try, and not us, we're not leading the effort on that, we support, but um, that's that's crazy uh, that that hasn't passed yet. There was a one that we put on there about making sure we get timely updates for the water management areas, and we just talked about that uh, with the DNR commissioner, and we had uh, Tracy Halston's guard from Roseau River uh, talk about that with her directly, and so we're going to we're gonna be forming a work group to address uh, that issue and a couple other things, too. And then um, requiring water to district permits when the DNR has a project. That one is, is still lingering out there, and we did discuss that with Commissioner Stroman. Um, not sure that will remain a high priority um, moving forward, but I just want to remind everybody, because yeah, everybody seems to, you ha can have a phenomenal year and a few months later, uh, you kind of forget that, uh, that we had a really great year. And sometimes you're going to have a year like this, but a lot of times it's, it's not going to be, you know, a passing or resolving 11 issues. And it's really because it's year after year after year of work. Um, uh, one of the items, uh, playing defense, uh, last year we did, um, Sock River had some uh, struggles with the legislature and uh, we uh, were able to work with them. We spent a lot of time working with uh, chairs of committees and members on committees where some bills that were going to negatively impact Sock and potentially all of us. Um, we, we really had to work hard to get that shut down so that it didn't continue to spread to other districts. And we are still feeling the, the impact from this. Uh, twice I testified this year, and I believe both times someone on a committee brought up uh, the crazy spending of the Sauk River Watershed District or something on that order, They're, the building that they put in place. Um, so we continue to work on this um, and it's, we don't, we can't always work on specific issues for a single watershed district. You know, we can't do that. But when there's an issue that's coming up and someone's uh, being uh, launched attacks at, we have to be involved because of the impacts that could spread to all of us. Uh, this is an old older picture. I didn't uh, go to try and find the video from this year, but I did testify twice this year. The first one was on, there was a proposal to use clean water funds to study the possibility of merging SWCDs and WDs once a one watershed plan was completed. That did not move forward. We did testify to that, uh, saying that it was premature. And uh, we, we, it was $263,000 they wanted to spend. And uh, I told them we could, we would be willing to meet for free and discuss some of the issues that we already know are gonna be uh, very large stumbling blocks, um, but that didn't move forward. And then we also uh, put forward a bill about 
um, the obligation of a county to fund a 103E drainage projects once it's been legally ordered by a watershed district. And that did get a hearing and we testified on that. That didn't move forward, but it did certainly get some conversations started, which really was our, our biggest goal with that, with that legislation. So just a few more items left here. Um, developing state and federal policy statements to reflect our positions. So there were three, we invested this year with some legal work to maintain the integrity of our manager appointments and the integrity of being able to retain our authority as drainage authority. And so there were three different issues that the mod board went forward getting opinions on. The first one was when a manager was removed from a watershed district without cause. There's very specific guidance about how that is. Now it's not guidance. It's instructions about how a board manager can be removed and that was not followed. And we, so we have a lot of case case law research um, that we have now on file that we will have if this ever happens again. The, the drainage uh, projects, I just mentioned that one, once they're legally ordered, can a county just not fund it? So we have an opinion from the state agency on that. And then also there was a court case in um, Anoka County and they were being sued because they did not pick a manager from a list submitted by one city. Um, and they sued um, that went to the regular district court and appeals court. We have, we submitted a brief as a, a friend of the court and, and quoted some more research about what the intention of the law is and whatnot. So these, I, I'm not gonna spend any more time on that right now. We will get those up in a legal library on, on our website and we will present these findings in more detail. Um, it will take more than the time I have today though to really go into what we found and what we got out of that, out of that work. I think really what the statement or this objective was though, is to put together a policy book of positions that will always hold true for us. Um, we have our resolutions and they expire every five years, but there's some that just always are sticking around. And what are those? So uh, we do need to do uh, some work on that. Uh, and that's a goal. This is just a quick screenshot of the, of the, document that we got from the Board of Water and Soil Resources and they determined that it was pretty clear in statute that the county needed to fund those projects. We partner, partner with various groups to track legislation. Uh, this is just a few of them. We do have a meeting every Friday during session uh, with most of the partners on here and we do also have meetings um, on our own with the DNR and on our own with the League of Minnesota Cities, but the remainder of those are often in this weekly call. And the point of that call is, um, do, does anybody know what the background on this bill is that they saw? And make sure that we didn't miss some bills uh, with each other. So it's background finding, is it, does it have legs? What do we need to do? If it's something that's hot, we figure out how we're gonna work together. And we also go over the schedule for the next week when are the hearings, what bills are coming up. And so it's a really a effective uh, meeting that we have every week. And I've probably never told you that we did that. So um, that is something that we, we do and uh, will continue to do. Uh, the last two here, ensure legislative positions are in line with the mission, vision, and core values. So it was good that we went back to this strategic plan and looked at it to give you a report because I forgot that one was even in there. So I think the next step is to review, uh, to assign this review process to our two committees, um, just to add that as a checklist of uh, work to do. And then uh, promote watershed management principles and support the formation of new watershed organizations. I really think that's two very specific uh, different things there. Uh, for new watershed districts, I will say, I would say twice a year on average, somebody calls me and wants to know how they could possibly form a watershed district. And it's usually like with associated with the one watershed, one plan. And of course I, I speak to them about how that works, why it, why it happens. And then always, I'm always available to speak to people if they would like to have a discussion at a one watershed, one plan meeting or, or um, 
joint powers board, whatever, we can certainly uh, do that. And Bowser has also said they would uh, always be willing to discuss that. And um, potentially, I guess, if we really want to see that more watershed districts are formed, we would need to assign more resources and take a more proactive approach there. I'm not sensing that that's a, a super high priority uh, for the board, but um, since it is in our strategic plan, we probably should look at it one more time. So then um, that was the, the new watershed districts. The last one is promote watershed management principles. I would say this is the core of what I speak to whenever I go anywhere that I speak, the importance of managing water on a watershed scale. And a few times where we really pushed that message, um, I was able to testify to the Clean Water Council in Pam's absence, um, our former Clean Water uh, Council representative who, um, who did eventually pass away, but she was unable to attend and they allowed me to speak uh, directly to the Clean Water Council. And I just really hit on the importance of watershed management. We submitted joint letters with our local government partners to the Clean Water Council. And just recently we submitted a policy paper on the position we have about how watershed-based funding should work. And that, that screenshot there is, you don't have to be able to read it obviously, but um, down the side is nine, is uh, several different options of what the policy could be to on how to distribute that money. And then across the top are the different um, parameters. Like why, what would we use to determine how we should use the money? And then the color coding is, is it a match? Does it, does it meet that? Does it not meet that? Or, or is it a clear match? And so you can see there is one, there is one idea across the bottom that is green for everything. And so that policy, we've showed through this analysis that that policy would, we, we think is, is the best way to move forward. And then, so we submitted that to Bowser and now the Metro Watershed Districts are discussing this at their watershed district meetings and watershed management organization meetings, and then writing a letter also to say, yes, we support this and this is why, and this is how it would impact us. So that is that is a new strategy we're using and really focusing on those principles because that's what's at stake. And if we don't have solid watershed management principles being used in the clean water fund, I don't know that we can get the, the Clean Water Fund renewed. It, we just have to make sure that we use solid and not um, just give money to everybody because that's what we do type of methodology. So the, the next step is just continue to send this message home. Um, just a couple of examples here, lobbying and advocacy. And I, I need to do a better job letting everybody know the type of work uh, that I do on a daily basis. This just happened today. Um, there is, there was a survey that got sent out to SWCDs, counties, WMOs, WDs. Julie Westerland, who sent it out, called me this morning and she sent this out, this email out and said, we've gotten 30 responses, but none of them are coming from the watershed districts. Well, there's a couple there, but 25 responses are from SWCDs. Um, so we are going to, I'm going to, you know, remind administrators, hey, you've got to fill out that survey, make sure we get that. Julie said, if you would rather talk to her directly, you can call her rather than answering the survey. She'll take your feedback. And if you need more time in case you just didn't see it, uh, the deadline is June 30th. Call her, tell her you need a little bit more time. Happy to work with you. So whenever Julie does something, she usually contacts me first or when Bowser is going to send anything out, we usually know about it ahead of time so that we can keep the make sure that our members know that something's coming. This was yesterday. There's a legislative committee call, a subcommittee call on wa Minnesota water policy. They had a meeting and it just, I mean, like just a few days ago, they put out the agenda. And one of the issues was SWCDs and watershed district funding and governance. And so I attended the meeting. There's, there were, there's a paper on it, but then also you could, what this picture on the screen is that there were different topics and you could enter comments and anybody in the meeting could, and then you could respond to each other's. And, and so it was, it was really kind of a unique, uh, I, I would like to use this again, it's called Padlet. But one of the comments that I made 
um, in the free section where you could just add any comment, I said, as a reminder, the general fund levy for watershed districts has been restricted to the same amount for 20 years now. We need both SWCDs and WDs to have the ability to fund operations and revenue sources need to have the ability to be adjusted over time. Imagine if counties or the legislature had to operate at the same levels as in 2001. It doesn't work. So that got submitted and the this committee is made up of senators and legislators. So I'm continuing wherever I can find an opportunity to send our message, I do. And this happens on a regular basis and um, I just need to you know, let everybody know all of these little things that happen. And this was July 12th, uh, there was, we had a request wondering if we could support a, some federal legislation and it's uh, for an act that I, I hadn't heard of yet, the Mississippi River Restoration and Resilience Initiative. So what this would do, it, they're um, stating an amount of $300 million would go to an organization that would then distribute uh, money and coordinate efforts along the restoration of the Mississippi River. So the MOD board considered it and we were able to send a letter to Betty McCollum saying, yes, She's the one who is is who authored it. Um, yes, we support you and uh, sent that off. It, it didn't take a ton of time. Of course, it did take some time. But um, so this is the type of thing that this is one. Maybe we didn't have a specific resolution, but this is something that we would just support on a regular basis. You know, we're the headwaters of the Mississippi. We need more money to flow into 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 the basin and. Uh, you, it's coordination, it's everything that we do uh, just on a larger scale. So that, just in the last couple of weeks, there were uh, three examples of lobbying that happens uh, kind of uh, behind the scenes. So this, we're at the end here, the summary. We invested in legal research that will help us, um, will help WDs down the road for, for decades to come. We increased our circle of influence with state agencies. We strengthened our government st structure and uh, we survived two legislative sessions in COVID without any bills passing that had negative impacts to us. So bottom line, we strengthened our influence, didn't lose any ground legislatively during the pandemic. So just uh, the, my last thoughts here, how you can help. Of course, the more people we have on our team, the more we can get done. So uh, get involved. We have several openings uh, for committee members um, from all three regions. We put out a call for that um, in a, two newsletters ago and no one responded. So please think about uh, serving on a committee. The link is on your agenda. The newsletters that we send out, please read them, familiarize yourself with our website. We've got a lot of resources on there. Connect with your legislators as often as you can, especially during the summer. If they're at events, connect with them. And you don't have to have an issue that you want to talk to them. Just say, hey, we'd love to catch up and let you know what we're doing in our district. So please do that. That's, that's our biggest asset right there, your relationships with your legislators. Um, if you have a promotional resources that you've already developed, uh, if you share those with us, if you think it could be used statewide, please share it and we'll see how far we can uh, run with that. Follow us on social media, share, comment on the stories. The more, uh, it, the more comments and likes you get, the more it gets uh, promoted in streams. Focus on uh, solutions. If you have any ideas about how we can solve some of the problems facing us, uh, let us know. Invite the MOD directors to your next meeting. Um, this is a focused effort that the MOD board is undertaking. Uh, communicate with them off them. They're your conduit uh, to, the, to the ins and outs of how, the op of how MOD operates. Attend events, and if you have someone on your board who is not attending events, encourage them to come. You know that it, it uh, I don't think you ever feel like you waste your time when you go. I certainly don't. And um, I, I love our events and I think they're well worth attending. And have an elevator speech ready when somebody asks you, uh, so what is a watershed district or what do you mean watershed management is the most important? So have those, practice those, maybe you work on them together as a board to just uh, see if you're all ready. So I'm gonna turn it back over to Mary to uh, talk a little bit about the, the next steps as she mentioned 23, 2023 to 2025.
Thank you, Emily. Next steps, um, we're going to be coming to you, as I said, at the annual meeting, asking for your input. And so what we'd like you to do is start thinking now about where you want MOD to go and what you want MOD to look like. We, um, it will be a creative way to provide that feedback. And then the committee will take it and come up with a new plan that you would get to review and vote on. So we're not doing this in a vacuum. We're doing this with your help. So at this point, I'd like to turn it over to Ray Bone, who's going to give us a legislative update. Ray. Can you hear me? Yes. OK. Hello, everyone. Um, first, I'd like to, uh, like to thank everybody who helped with the legislative activities this past, this past session. Um, the last, I, I got to admit, the last two sessions have been fairly bizarre. And that's, that's a fairly common refrain I hear from all my, uh, my lobbyist friends that have been in the business for a while. It's just, uh, and actually, and actually uh, a lot of people are, are uh, disconcerted about it and wondering if it's something they want to continue to do because it, it, it was very problematic trying to talk to people and all those sorts of things. But before I get into that, I wanted to mention uh, and recognize uh, Craig Leiser. Uh, you know, Craig was really a bulwark on the uh, board when I was there. And, uh, and I want to just say I very much personally appreciate everything he did. And I hope people recognize, um, you know, how much he gave to, the, uh, to what, his own watershed district and MOD. But he really was a champion. So, uh, and then um, the other thing I want to say kudos to, to Mary and, and also Emily. Uh, just sitting here listening to your activities and what MOD is doing, it appears to me like you're certainly living up to the expectations of the organization when, when we did the reorganization. And certainly some of the things that I actually longed to do when I was the executive and couldn't do it because of time and resources, uh, those are being done now. So, uh, so you should also be recognized for the work that you do. Um, Again, uh, and it's also nice to know that Bowser still has my address, Emily. <laughs> what I'd like to do is say, um, uh, again, uh, quite a challenge for the session. And then, of course, with the special session, uh, Maude again gets a, gets a, a, a buy on the special session. Uh, we, you know, it was... It was um, Fairly interesting how the whole thing developed, and and they were really playing hardball at the end. Uh, the clean water, or I'm sorry, the the clean car fund uh, was a huge topic, was a huge stumbling block, and once the Senate gave on that, uh, things started moving along pretty quickly. As you know, this year was a budget year, it was not a policy year, so there and. And I think, again, because of the COVID uh, circumstances and the way they had to conduct the meetings remotely, to discuss any kind of heavy duty policy in, in a committee setting was virtually impossible. I mean, everybody was given like two or three minutes to talk. You really couldn't have the kind of dialogue that you needed uh, to, to really talk about policy in a meaningful way. So actually, I think holding back on the policy development was, was probably in everybody's best interest. Of course, when you're spending money, you're also talking policy. So, so that took place. Um, although when you got a numbers attached, it seems like it's a little easier. You know, the, the, the budget uh, came out, um, it seems like every time they had a budget forecast, more and more money appeared. So, so money wasn't in the end a, a, big, a, a big question. And then plus the federal money became more of a problem trying to figure out how do you manage all this money that's coming to the state from the feds. And I think they did finally find a compromise They put together a group of people to do that and not let the governor just decide how he thought it should be best spent. And in fact, they're having their first meeting, I think, next week and starting to divvy up $250 million for uh, first responders as an example. The and as as Emily said, and I'm not going to repeat many of the things she said, but you know it, it um, 
when you have sessions like this and you have the kind of liability dealing with with the pandemic and not having appropriate or not having virtually much access at all to legislators, I think the important thing, number one goal should be to minimize damage and make sure that they are not, uh, in fact, doing something that's criti going to critically harm you. Um, you know, as, as um, Emily said, there was, there was a discussion about Salk River that continues to be there. And it's, and it's certainly something that, that I had to discuss with legislators wanting to know what is going on there. And uh, um, so that's an issue um, that, that we have to watch very carefully and make sure that we're, we're responsive uh, to that. Um, the, um, I guess what I'd like to do is just kind of review some of the, the major highlights uh, of, the, uh, of the budget. And I, th I thought we did pretty well on the uh, Clean Water Fund. Uh, we retained the drainage uh, technical assistance program, which, which I thought uh, was important. And uh, we also, uh, the Lower Min got, got its dredge money, which is important for them. The, the River River Basin and the Red Board got all the money that they had asked for and basically received in the past. Um, there was a little movement on soil health for cover crops got about 1.3 million, uh, three, five million uh, to deal with those issues, which is a, I think a first time, uh, first time event. The, the one thing that was a little interesting and we had a lot of discussion on was Bowser's proposed water storage program. And we, we were unsure exactly what they're trying to accomplish with that. And I think that given the fact that just about every watershed district in their plans, you know, have has water storage uh, programming. We didn't understand why the state had to set up its own program. Uh, you know, just help us fund what we have already planned. And that was kind of our argument. And um, the governor really wanted that. So, so they got it. And we're, I guess we have to pay close attention to see what Bowser is going to do with that, and hopefully they'll um, they'll listen to us in terms of how how that money could be spent, or or better spent. Um, we're we're concerned about the amount of money that is going into these agencies and how that money is being spent, and what kind of staff development they're getting. Um, when it was clear when I was on the G sixteen that. That, that money was supposed to be going to the local level and, and a lot of it is going i think too much is going back to the states state agencies um again just enhancing the adoption of the cover crops there was uh, a, a new new project there, program there for four million uh and there was um the swcd capacity funding uh, there was discussion, there was legislation about trying to, the second year, trying to get some money uh, to cover the 12 million per year, was what they've been getting, uh, to, to, to have an additional fee on um, real estate transactions. Um, that, however, fell by the wayside in conference committee, and they did end up taking the full 24 million out of the clean water fund again. And that I mean, to me, I think it's clear that that's problematic as it relates to that fund and the constitutional issues. But, but on the other hand, you know, they've got to be able to operate too. So I, I you know, I, the, the legislature is between a rock and a hard place and the legislature won't do anything in terms of taxation, uh, won't allow them any taxation. And um, as a result, they're, they're kind of stuck too. Um, the uh, let's see the watershed districts. There were a number of watershed districts that did get additional monies, um, not only through the clean water, but also also through LCCMR. Uh, some pretty hefty amounts. So uh, congratulations to all of them. Um, one. 
one issue that came up towards the end was the potential merger, voluntary merger study of watershed districts and SWCDs. And we argued against that because after discussions with the SWCDs, I think there was just a lot of questions. It was not well enough defined. I think that's the sort of thing is all you do is just scare a lot of people. And, and, and what was interesting, that legislation said that if you, uh, you, had, to, you had to have uh, uh, um, completed your comprehensive plan in one watershed in order to, to talk about merging. Well, and I told the author right away when, when he, when he uh, introduced the bill, I said, you're gonna chase people away from the one watershed, one plan because if they don't adopt it, then they don't even have to worry about a merger. So and that was beginning to happen. <laughs> so anyway, anyway, and I think he realized that, um, but I think that's probably gonna come back. And, and I don't know, frankly, if Bowser is gonna try to get people together and talk about that. Now, another issue is we did not want Bowser to conduct the study. We thought that would be a conflict with them. Um, so there were a number of, I think, pretty, pretty good reasons why that wasn't ready for prime time. Um, and frankly, I, I, my attitude is it probably should wait another five to eight years before you really start discussing anything like that, um, because people just are not in that phase right now. Um, we had the issue with the draining, some of the drainage issues as it, uh, as it relates to counties and funding and all that. And I would, I would uh, presume that we're going to be, be doing some work on that over the summer and fall to see if there's a way to kind of uh, work out some of those issues. Because those issues have been around, I think, uh, you know, for 25, 30 years. And we really need to get some of those resolved because it's just taking too much, too much energy, I think, um, from watershed districts and counties uh, to deal with those issues continually. They need to be put to, put to rest. And, uh, and I think we can do that. Um, another big one was the, was the eminent domain issue. Um, that's something we obviously watch very closely, but it, have, it didn't really go anywhere. Uh, the same thing, the, the general levy increase, we did talk to both tax committees and we're basically told uh, we're not gonna deal with that this year. And what we, I think what we need to do is that the watershed districts, especially the districts that need that tax increase, you, you need to be able to convince your local legislators that it is needed. Um, because if, if you can't convince them, we certainly can't. So I think it's important that you spend some time cultivating your local legislators on that issue. Because it only takes really sometimes just a few legislators pushing an issue and, and the job can get done. Um, but right now we have no one up there that's even willing to touch that, that issue with a 10 foot pole. So um, let's see if there's anything else. There, um, there, for those that are interested in, in CARP and CARP tagging, uh, there was a sunset on the ability to do that. Uh, and that sunset was repealed. So now that it's gonna be a long, long standing bill or long standing legislation. Uh, the SWCD supervisors kind of just were allowed to come up to our level, our compensation level of $125. Uh, they've been at 75, I think 75 the last, um, the last several years. Uh, they had not kept pace with us. They always wait till we, we do it first and then they come along and, and piggyback on, uh, on us. Uh, I think a, another thing, especially here in Dakota County was the, they disallowed uh, uh, bulk sales of water, uh, which was something that was uh, some folks in Dakota Co County were trying to sell water. And that has that been disallowed, you can't do that. And, and frankly, as you can see, water, um, when it comes right down to it is, is, our, is our lifeblood. And it's actually in some ways more important than oil and any other commodity. You've got to have water to exist. 
and and I think it's going to be a real big issue. And in fact, that's one of the reasons the Great Lakes Commission was established. Uh, back when I worked in the governor's office, there was discussion about moving water south through our gas pipelines in the summer. And I'll tell you that uh, that got you know, the governor then interested in how do how do we deal with that and setting up the the federal basically a, a federal established commit. Uh, 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 commission was the way to do it, and that was done. So we do have some protection in that regard, but but that that issue we not heard the last of that issue. I'll tell you that right now, because as a, this climate change keeps keeps making these extreme conditions, um, we're going to see extreme remedies being proposed. So. With that, I, I would be happy to answer any questions if anybody has any questions uh, about the session. Again, I think uh, Emily said it best. We weren't, we didn't, uh, we're not really uh, damaged in any way. So I think with under the conditions, that's probably a win. Thank you, Ray. If anyone has any questions, just come on off mute and ask them. Hearing none. If I, could, if, I could, if I could add just one thing, there were some questions about a, a number of small policy provisions, policy bills for uh, water water management, invasive species management, those sorts of things. And those really, all that policy stuff, the Republicans insisted on throwing out. They were in the House bill, but they all got thrown out uh, in the Senate. Uh, the Senate did not want to deal with those policy issues this year. So that's, um, that's basically what happened to many of those bills. Thank you. Any questions? Yes. Um, this is Paul Degree from the Clearwater Watershed District. Hi, Paul. How are you? I'm um, good. How are you? For Mr. Bowen is, who are the legislators that you're working directly with? at the Capitol, what districts are they from? I mean, who, who, who are you communica communicating with? It depends on the topic. Well, any topic, any topic that has to do with our, our watersheds, who, who are they? Uh, Rick Hansen, who is the chair of the Environment Committee. In the okay, is he Republican or Democrat? I'm not familiar with him. He's a Democrat. Okay. Uh, and, and he's also chair of the committee. Okay. We have uh, Paul Mark Marquardt, who is the chair of the tax committee. T Republican or Democrat? He's a Democrat. Okay. Is there? Are you working with any Republicans on this? On yeah. Do you communicate with any Republicans on our? Uh, with a few. For for our mod. <laughs> a few. Uh, Paul Torgelson, who is a Republican. Okay. He's the one who he's the one who wanted to um, wanted to do the merger study. So I communicate a lot with him. Okay. Um, uh, Weber, Senator Weber. Okay. And he's, uh, Senator Weber is head of the property tax division. Um, and he, he also has watershed districts in his area. So we we're hoping to get him involved in, in that property tax issue. We've also, we've also talked to the, uh, um, I'm trying to think. Uh, oh, the chair, the property right. chair in the uh, uh, in the house as well on the general levy increase. I I I'd have to pull my list to see, you know, people that we talk to. Basically, <laughs> basically, what we try to do, and what I try to do is work 
work through primarily through the chairs of the bodies because the chairs basically run the legislature and the, the committee the committee members um, you know they obviously get input but in the end it's the chairs that put the bills together and and if you can get the chair on your side you're usually um, usually in pretty good shape. Uh, Representative Fisher is another one that we rely on. Uh, he is from, uh, I want to say Stillwater, uh, Lake Elmo area. Uh, he's, he knows a lot about water. One of the problems, one of the problems you have at the Capitol is that you don't know, you don't have a lot of people that know a lot about water management. And as a result, um, there are a few, few people that, that we believe know what, know what you're talking about when you talk to them. And I think those are, those are some of the, some of the, um, the people that we gravitate to in terms of trying to make our position. There's the, there's also the, uh, there's a commission, a water commission um, that we communicate with um, and their members. The committee members we speak to um, on a, you know, if we need to talk to them, if they have a bill that we want to um, impact, We'll talk to the individual committee members. Okay. Does as a mod organization, do we do we um, send any money to any of these elective officials? Oh no, no, no. We That's don't do any of that. No, you can't. Uh, you have to have a pack, and that's okay. separate from mod. Maybe that's something that we should be looking at down the road is start grooming our own grooming our own legislators. I, I would not suggest that for a uh, for a governmental entity. I I I, uh, I don't think that would go over well. I mean, we're well, we're an association now. There are a lot of people up there, a lot of groups up there that have PACs and give a lot of money. But I I don't think as a governmental entity you should be doing that. I would not advocate that for for mine. Uh, I've got other clients I would advocate it for. That would certainly help me, so I wouldn't have to give all give all my money to them. <laughs> but right now, right now I'm you know I basically write personal checks if I go to fundraising events and whatever. Yeah. So at this point, thank you, Ray. Thank you, Paul. Um, it just gives more credence to the fact that we have to visit our legislators um, and maintain a relationship with them. It's break time. It's 2.19 according to my computer's clock. So let's go until 2.30 as a break and then we'll reconvene back here for um, introductions and updates. Thank you.
We'll get started in about two minutes. Hello, Mary. Hi, this Marcy. Is Marcy. Yeah. You run a great meeting. Thank you. Yes. I'm going to push you up first. Oh, thank you so much. I have uh, babies here who are on their way to England. So uh, I got just a limited time for them. So, And you but need to spend it all with them. Well, don't you think? <laughs> yeah. Yes. yes. And at this point, they're quiet and napping. So <laughs> that's a, that's, but you know, that, that doesn't last long. No, I just let one of the cats no. in here because she was banging on the door. And so now I'm hoping <laughs> she will take a nap. <laughs> okay, good. Did she find your lap? No, she's not a lap sitter. Okay. Yeah. You're good. Good. Okay. It's 2.30. And it's time for you to meet some of your representatives. Um, in addition to the board, we have a lot of great people serving on committees. So I'd like to introduce Mar Marcy Weinert. She is our new representative on the Clean Water Council and we are thrilled to have her. Marcy. Well, thank you, Mary. Yes, my name is Marcy Weinert. I live in Moundsview, Minnesota, and I am a current manager on the Rice Creek Board, uh, Rice Creek Watershed District. Uh, prior to uh, joining as a manager a year and a half ago, I served three years on the uh, Watershed District's Citizens Advisory Committee. And my husband and I actually own a, uh, our house is located uh, adjacent to a judicial ditch. So uh, the watershed has easement across our property on the ditch. So I uh, moved here five years ago, and when I inquired about what that body of water was, and my husband told me it was a judicial ditch, I knew exactly what we were talking about, because uh, almost 30 years ago now, I served on the Renville County um, Board of Commissioners, and at that time, the commissioners were indeed the ditch inspectors and the ditch authority. So I've seen lots of ditches in my career. Um, I recently retired from the Minnesota Department of Agriculture, where I was a staff person with the Minnesota Ag Water Quality Certification Program, and uh, at, which was a recipient of the Clean Water Fund. So uh, glad to be here, and certainly to Emily and to the MOD board, so pleased to be representing such a wonderful organization. I think we saw um, in Emily's position, uh, presentation the work and the planning that's been going on for years to strengthen this board. Uh, Ray did a very thorough job of updating you all on the recent clean water uh, fund appropriations. And I too share the direction of using those clean water funds locally and for projects on the ground. And when you have projects on the ground, you have the populace seeing what can be done with the money that um, they allowed to be gathered. So it's very important to, for the reauthorization of the fund, which is gonna show up way before we even realize it. So currently now the um, biennial budget of 2223 has been appropriated and the Clean Water uh, Council will begin the, believe it or not, 24-25 year appropriation of the, um, of the fund, uh, those discussions starting in February. The Clean Water Council has two committees. One is the policy committee and the other is the budget and outcomes. And I've been appointed to the policy committee. So, uh, so pleased again to hear the report, um, the first part of the meeting, Emily, um, and to Mary and to the rest of the board, um, looking forward to be working very closely with you as we move forward. 
I would, I would also get, I would also give, okay. um, if people are particularly interested in the Clean Water Council's work, you can subscribe to the e-newsletter, which Paul Gardner, the director, puts out um, at least once a week, which includes an array of uh, projects and opportunities for people to uh, see what's going on with the Clean Water Council. So thank you. Thank you, Marcy. We're really looking forward to working with you too. Good. And I'm looking forward to meeting you all at the annual conference. When we can all see each thank other you. again, face to face. That's right. Yay. That's right. <laughs> so thank you so much. Thank you. Um, to give you a quick board update, most of the information has been covered in the prior slides. The, in order to be more responsive to the membership, the board is now meeting monthly and we're doing it via Zoom. So it's easier for us to get to and also easier for people to um, listen in to the board meetings. Our agendas are posted out on the Minnesota mnwatershed.org website. So that's got the link in it too. Minutes are not posted until they're approved. Same with the budget information. So it's not what we're trying to keep anything from you. It's just that it's got to be approved before we post it. Um, we've been meeting with the Maui Executive Council. We met once this summer and we're going to meet again in September, I believe. And that's to promote better communications between the two organizations. The committees have been very, very busy, but they need your help. Most need additional manager members. Um, committees are not like signing your life away. It meets two to three times a year. As an example, the governance committee, um, the part of it that's dealing with the bylaws and the MOP, they've already completed their work for the year. We had two, maybe three meetings. Um, and the MOP is approved by the board and that is out on the website. And the bylaws will be given to you around November 1st, right, Emily? Um, November 1st, everything will be sent out um, for the annual meeting. And that's when you'll get a chance to take a look at it. And um, then at the meeting, you can approve it or disapprove it. Um, at the committee's suggestion, the MOP now includes a provision for emergency policies and, and resolutions. And that's in section 8.2. If you're interested in joining a committee, check out the section on the website and let Emily or me know. We would love to have you join us in all of this fun. Also, if your boards want a board member, a MOD board member to speak at your um, meetings, just let us know and we'd be more than happy to zoom in and um, attend and answer any questions that you may have. At this point, I'm gonna turn it over to Joe Collins to give a Bowser update I don't think Leroy Osi, who is our, uh, and Jill Crafton are online, um, but they are also Bowser board members. But Joe, take it away and you're still on mute. Hi, I'm Joe Collins. I'm on the Bowser board. I represent urban watershed districts. Uh, just before I start, I give a little quick background. I worked for the city for 41 years that including writing HUD grants in which also had HUD audits. So I'm gonna be talking later on about the, quickly about the PRAP and the water-based management. My other part of working for the city, I had worked for the city council and I was briefly on the city council. So that whole concept of working with bureaucracies, elected officials kind of gives me some background on, as a Bowser board member, looking at watershed districts at the local level, also recognizing that Bowser is a bureaucracy that has to respond to the legislature and also knowing that the legislatures, they have to have projects to say to their citizens, just like we do, we're doing something. And kind of taking all that together is really what I'm trying to uh, present in opinions when I'm on the Bowser board, but using that background. Just quickly, I want to talk about the performance review assistance program, which was that PRAP. During the listening sessions this spring with the administrators, I and Jerry Van Amberg, uh, who is the chair of Bowser, and I think he was on or is on um, this meeting, attending this meeting, we heard some concerns about the PRAP. 
Just for a quick review, PRAP is a report that's required by the Minnesota legislature. It's really looking at compliance and measurable goals. It's really looking at local government um, accomplishments with plan objectives, meeting administrative mandates, and then collaboration with stakeholders. The local government uh, organizations include watershed districts, soil and water, and um, water management. So again, a quick review, they have uh, every year, they have a, a level one performance evaluation, a level two performance evaluation. And if there was ever a need for level three, that's really when the organizations are kind of in uh, trouble. Uh, during 2020, the watershed districts had an 84% compliance with the level ones, which I think is good. And this was also recognizing at the time that the PRAP coordinator had retired and there was COVID. Um, but there was still some discussion at the board level, like, you know, why was the watershed not doing as well as some of the other organizations? And again, I don't think at the time during the discussion, they recognized that the PRAP coordinator was retiring and was trying to do everything before he retired. But um, during the listening sessions, I heard concerns, I and Jerry heard concerns about PRAP. And again, recognizing the watershed districts, out, especially outstate have small staff, those, you know, having, having somebody come in to do an audit or have someone asking all kinds of questions on performance, that can be stressful. I get it um, because I had to deal with that when I was dealing with HUD. But also they had mentioned, and I thought this was a good example, that some of the questions that watersheds were trying to respond to was something that they had no control over. Something, for example, that the county the county which they and in which they uh, are located, they had to do something, and yet the watershed districts, through the PRAP, were being questioned on how how successful you were. So in that, I brought this issue up in front of the board and some of the other board members. Um, this is during the spring. Some of the other board members really said, "Okay, you know, we do recognize that as a concern," and I also brought up. Um, spoke to Angie Becker Kudelka, who is a lead staff person at Bowser. I'm on the audit committee. I'm the chair of that. So we're going to start trying to review the PRAP evaluation process. I haven't started this yet. I'm going to be trying to talk to Angie in August. As we start working this out, I want to talk to Emily on how is it best to get some survey or information from the watershed districts about that report. Report is required by the state or the state legislature, but how can that report be better, um, more workable for the watershed districts? So given that this is in August, so I'm not sure we're gonna be able to accomplish this, this during this year, but I wanna start the process. So one is talking to the Bowser staff, then talking to Emily, then talking to watershed districts, on this um, program or this evaluation process and then seeing how we can make it better and more workable. So that's kind of the first thing I want. Second topic I wanna to talk about is the water-based implementation funding. We all know with watershed districts, and I know this, it, that we know that we have to do targeted, prioritized performance, meet the goals, Throughout all our discussions, we always have that. We know that that is something we're doing, and I think we are doing it. Um, but in that process, you know, I, I'm, I'm just going to get, first of all, I have to step back and say, I really support Mott's analysis, which Emily wrote and uh, with board members on the water based implementation funding, that analysis that was sent to Bowser. I think it was a very good analysis and that's what I support and that's what I'm going to be pushing at at the August 11th committee meeting and then at Bowser. Um, now I'm just going to give a few comments on the water base. The one water said one plan. When I was on the committee originally two years ago, three years ago, it really looked like you're going to be dealing with a regional issue, a, huck, a, a larger huck level and it would be really dealing with some regional issues. So that made sense to me. 
I read these plans, the one watershed plans. I read the local, uh, the comprehensive plans. I try to look, when I'm doing that, I try to look at the websites. The more I read, at least with the watershed one watershed plan, I feel like they read like the typical comprehensive watershed management plans. You know, they there is a, a level one priority, there's a level two priority. Um, and then if you have a lot of money, you get to do pri pr priorities in number three. So um, on the outstate area, which I'm an urban, represent urban watersheds, when I read the one watershed plans, I think, okay, I accept what they say outstate because I think they are telling me what the local issues are. And that's something, especially on agriculture, that I really have no confidence upon. And yet, um, I'm still not convinced that they're really dealing with a, a larger regional issue, except I think the one watershed plans deal with um, really encourage collaboration. So I think that's a good move. The one watershed plans that have been approved out state, I think there has been some local discussions and local commitments. So that I, I think I'm gonna rely on. Um, in the metro area, I think it's different. We have years or decades of doing uh, comprehensive plans. And those comprehensive plans have been targeted, prioritized at measurable goals. And those are things that already exist in the metro area. And so dealing with that one larger Huck area, like, and I'll use in Capital Region Watershed District, it's Mississippi East. I'm not sure that totally works. I'm not, as more I read, the more I'm less convinced. So I look at the that and say, again, I used to work with bureaucracy. I used to deal with being a led um, city council. I know you have to check the boxes and I know that Bowser has to respond to legislature. So at the larger Huck level in the, in the metro area, I think, okay, we need to have some collaboration. I, I'm not sure that the local watershed districts in their comprehensive plans have written confirmation by the local governments um, saying that they agree with the plan. I think there's been collaboration there might not have been an official written statement saying that the city of St. Paul, you know, accepts the Capital Region's Watership Plan. I think that's an extra task that we have to do. But that said, I think at the metro level, rather than do the exact one watership plan, you know, as it's kind of developed for the outstate, I think it might be that we do like a, a hybrid, like you said, um, priorities, reduce total asphalt, but uh, not asphalt, total phosphorus, and then have every uh, organization say, here's how they're doing it, you know? So it's more of a, a statement at the local in the metro area, I think elected officials have to be able to point to projects and say, this is what we're doing. I believe in the metro area that the um, existing watershed districts are doing measurable goals, doing water quality, and we just have to be able to put it in a, um, a mechanism that is acceptable to Bowser who has to submit it to the state. And um, so again, I really support what Maud has done in their analysis and in their letters, in their statement that has been sent to Bowser, and that's what I'm gonna be pushing. I think that's it. <laughs> Any comments? Any questions for Joe? Emily, you've got something? Yes, I just have to point out that I was not the author of that. Oh, you always are. <laughs> I uh, coordinated the administrators in the metro and they worked together and there were uh, uh, three or four that did an amazing job. Right. I worked with them, but I cannot take the credit. It's okay. All because of Mawa, but thank you. All right. Okay. Does anyone else have any questions or comments for Joe? Thank you, Joe. Next, I'd like to have um, Sherry Davis-White talk about the Local Government Water Roundtable. Sherry. Thank you. First, let me say it's been raining at my house. 
Yes. <laughs> Good news. Um, I am with the Minnehaha Creek Watershed District. The other two MOD board members who are on the round table are um, Jean Tiedemann, who is with Red Lake River Watershed District, Region 1, and Ruth Schaefer, who's with Middle Fork Crow River Watershed District for Region 2. Um, the round table is a collaborative of the state organizations for um, the watershed districts, the soil and water conservation districts, and the counties who find that they have a lot of a lot to share. Um, out of this big conference that took place a few years ago up in St. Cloud came the water the round table and also one watershed one plan came out of that effort. Um, the round table meets about three to four times a year. The organization set the agenda and uh, Bowser facilitates. The typical um, agenda would have uh, advocacy updates from the three organizations staff who are there. And also, we're meeting in August and we're going to continue to work on having um, implementation money for one watershed, one pan, plan to have that money um, trend upward. Um, that is the big, the big topic for next time. I'd be happy to answer questions. Anyone have any questions or comments for Sherry? Thank you, Sherry. You're welcome. Tim, um, Tim Dreitz is gonna talk about the drainage work group. Yeah, I'm a farmer in Southwest Minnesota and representing Maud on the drainage work group along with Emily and Chris Gunner who is administrator. Uh, basically for the people that don't know what the drainage work group is, it is a group of people that are, are mainly the main drivers behind the uh, drainage. It's county commissioners who are drainage authorities, DNR, Bowser, uh, ag commodity groups, environmental groups. And we try and get together and vet the bills before they go to the legislative and work out the problems in a, in a um, room instead of going and everybody lobbying for it. Uh, main thing we've been working with or MUD's main concerns on there have been the transfer of the the uh, drainage ditches from the counties to to the watershed drainage authorities and uh, bonding for those ditches is still done through the counties. And that's something we're trying to get done through a subcommittee. A few of the other things have been the reestablishment of drainage records and DNR guidance. As you can imagine, DNR isn't real friendly to drainage all the time. And we have been trying to work through a set of rules that everybody plays the same way by with them. And with that, I'll take any questions if anybody has them. Any questions or comments for Tim? Thank you, Tim. And now for the National Resource Conservation Service, we have Cassie Ahmed, who is a watershed engineer and new in this position, I think, right, Cassie? Yes, I am. So thank you for the opportunity to uh, speak at your meeting today. I appreciate it. Um, a little, here. thank you. Yeah, a little background on myself. Um, I grew up in Hutchinson, Minnesota and attended NDSU in Fargo with, uh, for agricultural engineering. And I started my career with NRCS uh, while I was in college in North Dakota. I worked for a few years there uh, after I graduated, moved out to Montana. And then in 2010, I came back to Minnesota. So I've been back in the state now um, as a field engineer, area engineer, and now in my new role as a watershed engineer. And I will be located out of our state office in St. Paul. So uh, currently in Detroit Lakes and gonna be relocating. I get a lot of questions about that, but I look forward to this new opportunity. So today I'd like to just discuss the program with you. Um, it, We'll be, um, I'll primarily be working on the NRCS um, PL566 watershed operations. And um, through this program, we can provide technical and financial assistance um, to project sponsors to develop watershed work plans and implement planned activities within a specific geographic area um, to benefit the general public. So a project may look like a, a flood control, um, irrigation, erosion reduction, water quality improvement, 
uh, public water and recreation, and then public fish and wildlife uh, projects. And we also do have some older PL566 projects or structures within the state that um, we can look at rehab on those. Uh, this project or this program is most suitable for large uh, multi-million dollar um, structures or projects. Um, we have other programs that work better for smaller scale. So this is looking at larger scale projects. Um, you know, through this uh, watershed program, NRCS has a direct relationship with a local sponsor and a sponsor could be a watershed district, uh, soil conservation district, city, county, uh, tribal, and um, who we will ask to help assist with the planning, um, or I guess that sponsor would be required to help with the planning, obtain any land rights, assume long-term operation and maintenance agreements for that, and, uh, um, and is responsible for any other non-federal in your work plan that would fit into this type of format, um, please feel free to reach out to me. Uh, I am, uh, and um, we will be providing some information here soon on the Minnesota NRCS website for additional information. Are there any questions? Cassie, could you put your email in the chat? Yes, I can do that. I can put my email and phone number there. That'd be great. Emily, you have something? Yeah, so Cassie called me a week or so ago and said, I think you said, my boss said I need to get to know you uh, because we need to get these <laughs> partnerships um, uh, uh, possible. And was this, was it, is this new money or like a program that they're bringing back? And was this a new position for you? So well, yes, this is a, oh, I'm sorry. A new position. This is an, sorry. <laughs> This is an old program um, and there is now new funding available for the program. Um, I believe in 2017 funding became available again. So states are starting to ramp up with watershed planning and um, putting new staff in place. So this is a new position for me and new in the state of Minnesota. Um, within, I guess, watershed planning hasn't been around, I believe since like the 90s, but don't quote me on that, but yes, new for me. Sherry. Um, could you give an example of, of projects that are suitable for your program? Um, so I guess up in like Northwestern Minnesota here, Florian Campground is a watershed project that was done, um, I believe about 30 years ago where they had created an uh, embankment structure uh, to pool water for recreational and uh, created a campground there with uh, facilities out there. Or we could do flood protection. Um, a good example of that would be the Snake River impoundment uh, up in Warren. And uh, that was to help prevent the flooding of the city of Warren. Thank you. Yep. Anyone else have a question or comment for Cassie? Hearing none. I'll just mention one other thing. The other place I was uh, telling Cassie was uh, Yellow Medicine uh, and Loco Parle and down in the Redwood uh, River watershed, Cottonwood River. They have uh, several impoundments down in Southwest Minnesota too that are just spectacular and uh, serve so many functions, multi-benefit projects. And they studied and found locations decades ago of where these could go. And uh, and many of them are decades old and and it's, it's really a great program. So as a Excited to hear that there's a renewed interest in and in, uh, getting these states uh, uh, geared back up to be able to do this. So, thank you so much, Cassie, for calling me and and uh, making this connection. Thank you, and don't forget about the Boys to Sue, which we all saw when we had our last face-to-face -face meeting. Um, so, summer tour. So, at this point, if it's okay with you, um, I. Do you, do people think we need another 10 minute break? I'm thinking not. I will say that I will not be as long winded this time on this presentation. This <laughs> quarter. 
<laughs> okay, so Emily, why don't you start your presentation? All right, yeah, um, I'm gonna add to the strategic plan of Emily to make sure that she always has a clock that she can see while she's speaking. I did not have that last time. I couldn't get myself back up. I'm just gonna share my screen here. Get this started from beginning. All right, so this is just a, a brief uh, overview of this resolutions process. And we're gonna just walk through a couple of examples of what can make a powerful uh, resolution and what um, could be better about some. So. Uh, quickly, so, you know, resolutions, what's the point? So if you think about that, you may have an issue that you've identified and, you know, first you're going to think, oh, how could we solve that? Then maybe the next thing you do is you, you see if anybody else, if your neighbors maybe have the same problem. And then you might even have uh, somebody, run it by somebody who isn't even involved. Like, I, I think of this, you know, when you, you take something home to your partner and say, Kelly, I got this issue, what do you think? And, and getting kind of that third party, uh, look at it, see if they have some solutions. And then if you start to find that people both have problems, you may want to agree to combine forces if it's warranted. And, and if you end up with too many issues, you have to prioritize those. And you're going to walk, you're going to work on those top ones that you think, you know, you have the best chance of uh, finishing and, but always kind of keeping those other ones on the back burner and listening for opportunities that could come up. And yeah, you're just always going to uh, stay alert uh, to the issues that might arise um, that you hadn't even thought was a problem. Maybe you have to shift your resources because a flood came up or something like that. So the reason I kind of go through that is just to compare it to our process here. So you have an issue, you're going to uh, write up a local resolution at your, at your local office. And to see if other people have the same issue, you, uh, you, will, you can talk to your neighbors and, and do this before you submit it, but you submit your idea uh, to MOD. The third party review is kind of that resolutions committee that's gonna take a look at it. They probably haven't read the resolution yet and they may look for ways that you could uh, clarify that or you know just kind of give it a, a once over. And when we vote, we're agreeing that, you know, if we combine our forces and our resources at MOD, we, this is an issue we should, that we should consider maybe uh, putting some of our resources to. Then it's the legislative committee that's going to take the issues and prioritize them if we have too many, which we do. We can't work on all of the issues on our books at once. Um, so they make a recommendation and the mod board makes that final decision on a platform. And then there's always offensive things. So when we want to promote something new, we play offense, but there is defense we have to play and those always come up too. So, you know, the role of our lobbying at the legislature is to push our ideas that we want to see happen, but then also constantly be on the lookout for something that we didn't see coming. So the timelines for this process we do right now uh, is the process a packet went out uh, to your administrators and uh, in July and August is when we want you to maybe formulate those resolutions and submit those to us. If you can get them to us by the end of August, that would be fantastic. The bylaws say that we don't even have to send you a packet until August and that um, you, it's 60 days before the meeting, you have to get it to us. That is a really quick turnaround. That's almost impossible to, to process all those things. Um, so we're asking if you can get them uh, to us by August 31st, that will help us get it through everything. Uh, if you can't, if you could just let us know that you have one coming, the resolutions committee will meet uh, in September with the resolutions that have been submitted. And then if there's one or two lingering out there, we can process those in a shorter meeting and perhaps even do that through email um, or a, a very short meeting. So then we're gonna get all of the resolutions back out to you with recommendations and uh, for the bylaws changes and for resolutions. You will discuss that at your board meeting in November and then come to vote at the MOD convention. You will need to be present uh, to be able to vote and you have two votes per, um, per watershed and um, you can't take both of them if you're the only person there. So <laughs> you need two bodies there to do that. 
The legislative committee will meet after our convention, make some recommendations, and in our January meeting, we will adopt a platform, and then we're heading to the legislature. It starts on July, January 31st next year until it ends. Hopefully it can end in May and not continue the special sessions. So a few things you should know about resolutions. There, these are the ones that are already on the books and your administrator has these. If you submit one that is already in, in the list, we will, the resolutions committee can uh, toss it out. So take a look at that. It is not impactful for you to send us one that already has been submitted. If you want to make a statement saying where this one is really important, the best way to do that is to send a letter to the legislative committee or the mod board stating that this is, is this important and why it is submitting a similar or an exact same or similar resolution um, is, is not effective. So uh, do that. Um, if you submit a resolution and it gets passed that contradicts one already on the books, the old one goes away. We can't have you know something that says it's for and something that says it's against. So if that happens, we will make sure that you know that if we pass one resolution, it will replace the old one. So you will be empowered with that information. A recent policy we adopted was a sunset policy. And what that means is after five years, if a resolution has been on the books, we remove it. Now, we make you aware of the ones that are set to expire. And if you think that needs to be um, continued, you need to renew it. Somebody needs to bring it back through the resolutions process. Otherwise, it's going to go by the wayside. So we have two of those this year from 2016 that haven't been resolved yet. One of those is uh, making human resources expertise available through MOD. So this came up, um, you know, we have some very small watershed districts and you maybe only need human resources help every once in a while. Is there a way that MOD could provide access to a contract for human resources? Could we, one of the ideas was Bowser was hiring a human resources uh, person at that time, could they help us? So we explored that. Uh, uh, turns out they are, they are very uh, full with their service. So different ways that you can solve this problem, but the idea was that MOD would be the vehicle to be able to provide that. Um, that will expire at the end of the year. If that's something you would like, uh, to stay active, bring that forward. The other one was for riparian buffers and uh, having those be eligible for a reduction in estimated market value when taxes get calculated. Um, not much work has been done on that and that will also expire. So when you think about resolutions, there's kind of three categories that you can submit an idea for. The obvious one is if you need legislative help, um, submit that issue. The other thing is if state agency advocacy is needed. Um, and sometimes an issue um, we start, a lot of times we'll start at the state agency rather than jumping right into the legislative action just to see if we uh, can make headway there. It's a lot easier to work within state agencies um, than trying to get uh, all of the members up at the Capitol on board with something. So. And the other thing that you can do is if you have um, suggestions for how we could change the bylaws or our, which we've heard it called the MOP, is the, um, the, the Manual of Operating uh, Policies and Procedures. So three different categories where you can submit your ideas. And a lot of times we think, you know, what's broken? What do we need fixed? But also think about how could we be um, really have a greater impact? What good things we could do? So it's not always about what's broken. It could be how could we be even better? So if you're going to submit something, there's two things that you need to submit. First is the re a resolution adopted by your board. And then we have a background document that we have you fill out where you describe the, describe the situation and what led to the issue that arose or, or why you think something would be a good idea to pursue. We are asking you to define potential solutions. How could we fix this? 
Now, this is a new step, this next one. Um, we're asking, what have you already done to date to try and fix the issue? Have you met with your legislators? Have you met with state agencies? Um, have, where did that go? And then we're also asking about who would be our potential partners in this fight if it's, a, if it's something we wanna try and fix and who would be the opponents. When you are preparing these resolutions, absolutely do not hesitate to give me a call if you're wondering um, if you're on the right track or if you want me to you know, review it and just see if there's um, ways that you can make it even stronger. I would love to um, uh, give some uh, feedback on that and and let you know uh, what I see. I used to serve um, on a national board of directors and we went through this process and I was on that committee. So I've seen, um, and then actually we had a, a, a book that had decades of resolutions in it for a national organization. And we went through all of those, rewrote them so that they were in proper form. And uh, it, it was Oh, I can't tell you how many hours I've spent on this stuff. So I can certainly uh, help you if, if you want some feedback. So obviously we're familiar with this. We do, we work with resolutions, the title, the whereas, and the resolve statements. I'm gonna break that down just a little bit before we look at some examples. The whereas statements identifies the problem, provides some rationale uh, for the desired outcomes, it should lead the reader to your conclusion. So that's almost like a geometry argument. If you remember back to the proofs, you're like, well, this is true and this is true, this is true, so this must be true. So really think about if someone unfamiliar with the topic, can they follow your logic? Be as factual as you can rather than speculative. Provide if there's references or bill numbers, statutes, try to include those um, if you can. And then if there's any really pivotal dates that are important, add those. Resolve statements. Now this is where it gets, um, where there can be a lot of area for really making strong result, you know, therefore be it resolved, where there's a lot of potential to do this really well. Um, so you want to describe the desired outcome. And you want to make sure that that statement by itself makes sense. Because when we put together the, our list of uh, res, uh, policies, we only include that last statement. So if that can't stand on its own and have somebody understand what you're wanting to do, it needs to be rewritten. And the form of the policy should start mod supports or mod opposes. You know, if you can put it in the positive, that's the best, but sometimes you end up with, with a topic that just, we really need to say we oppose something. So that's good too, but if you can put it in an affirmative type sentence, that is a little bit stronger. And this is one where it uh, gets tripped up a lot. Don't direct how to get the work done. If your resolution says mod will do this, we will rewrite it um, to say mod supports. Um, and we will, when we do that, we usually go back to the submitting organization and say, is this, is this what you meant? Just to make sure that we've captured uh, what you were trying to say. But it, it saying we will do something, uh, it just isn't really a policy then, that's a work order. Um, it should be uh, a single sentence in length and only contain one issue at a time. If there are a couple of issues that make sense to put in the same resolution, that's fine, but we will vote on them one at a time because often uh, folks will support one but not the other. So then just have it be and uh, further be it resolved statement. And then make sure that um, your resolution is consistent with the mission of our organization. So here is, uh, we have three examples. Example number one, MOD uh, will immediately engage the new DNR commissioner to fix the problems we are having with the DNR on ditch permits and will continue to work with them until the issues can be resolved. Now, this is not one that was submitted to us. It was submitted to another organization that I worked with um, and I just, I made it at fix, but this was actually one that came in. And uh, so you'll notice what's not so great about this is it doesn't say what we support or oppose. It says what we're going to do. And we're not even sure what the problem is here. We know who, uh, who the problem is with, but it, it's not specific enough. 
So if this was interactive and I could see all you, I'd ask you to see what you could come up with. But since it's not, I will uh, show you a couple of options on how this could be rewritten. So this one, we, we took the will out Ma and uh, then further looked into the issue a little further. Maud supports the right under Minnesota Statute 103E to perform standard maintenance on drainage systems. And that ended up to be um, what we looked at. And, and it was, the problem was uh, through the permits that were being issued by area hydrologists and not having consistent consistent a consistent way in order to decide how those permits were going to be issued and what conditions uh, needed to be met in order to get a permit so and uh, here is what we ended up with a policy on this one mod supports legislation modeled after house file 2687 and senate file 2419 of the 90th legislature so we had um, some so specific um, statute language that we could refer to reinforcing that the DNR cannot restrict existing rights to maintain and repair 103E public drainage systems. So hopefully you can kind of see how those are, um, how those are a little bit different than the, uh, the initial example and how those are more powerful. And uh, this, uh, we did work on this issue. Uh, we started with the DNR, then rather than going to the, to the legislature right away, we met with them and uh, this was a very active issue and concern in Rice Creek. And this is a letter rescinding a previous permit decision saying that they had to meet all these existing conditions in order to repair that ditch system. And then after that, this uh, all those conditions were rescinded, they made further changes within the DNR where they we're no longer allowing area hydrologists to make those uh, decisions. Um, they maybe are their initial recipient of the permit request, but then they formed a new review committee. They it kicked it up a level or two, and that was the final committee um, that had more experienced staff that made those decisions. So uh, this was a, a very effective resolution that got submitted and we got some great outcomes. Um, this one, this is from the organization that I was on. I, this one is just so crazy and it is really a good example. Um, so NACD, that's the National Association of Conservation Districts. I was on their board of directors representing Minnesota and uh, doing, and I was on the legislative committee and when folks would submit resolutions, it had to get through us before it would get on the, uh, on the agenda. So this is one that, this is word for word what it said. NACD will encourage Congress to contact and request the Secretary of the U.S. Department of Agriculture, the Department of the Interior, and the Department of Homeland Security to immediately address the border fence issue by developing and implementing a plan to maintain existing fence, replace ineffective fences, and fence the remaining miles of border between border states and Mexico. So, and the, the whereas statements really did not say much at all. So this looked like, and this was a few years ago, right when the, the you know, we're gonna build a wall issue was coming up. It looked like they wanted the National Association of Conservation Districts to um, support um, the idea of building a border wall. And so when, when this one came up, no one on the committee would move to, um, move to discuss it. It, it, it. Well, somebody moved, but it died for lack of a second. So I left the meeting and I, I, someone came chasing after me and it was the author and said, why, why wouldn't you listen to us? I mean, we're members. Why didn't you at least give us a chance to talk to our issue? I said, well, because building a border wall has nothing to do with conservation that I can't support that. Well, so then in the hallway, he tells me exactly what the issue is, which he did not explain in the whereas statements at all. Here is, they were able to request that the resolution be um, brought up on the floor. There was two thirds vote. Okay, so then this is what they ended. It was, I don't have the exact language, but this is what the issue really was. NACD supports new installation or repairs to existing fences along the Mexico border where feral cattle and boars cross 
disrupt farm operations and destroy healthy ecosystems by trampling grasses, crops, and trees. Now we're at least into a conservation issue. So before they just said, we need to fix the wall. And now you can see there's, they've turned it into a supports, uh, support issue and they're telling how that's, op how that's impacting conservation. I believe there was also a disease issue um, with some of the feral cattle that would come and, and but uh, not necessarily as much of a conservation issue there. But here, here we have it so much more connected and it did end up passing, but it almost uh, didn't get a vote. Uh, the last one, this is uh, one of ours that we had a few years ago. Um, it's well written and it uh, did allow us to very quickly um, uh, act on this. So I'm just going to go through this. Uh, this was, I believe this was submitted by Two Rivers um, Watershed District. I'm just going to read through these. I know that's kind of annoying for PowerPoint slides, but here's what they had. Whereas Congress is preparing the 2018 Federal Farm Bill, which will contain a conservation title with appropriations for federal conservation programs for ag land, including CRP. Whereas CRP is a principal federal state conservation program for ag lands, but enrollments are present, presently at the acreage cap. Whereas the state of Minnesota has been a leader in developing and implementing approaches that maintain ag productivity while integrating conservation practices for water quality and habitat benefit and has shown its commitment through its constitutional mandate for conservation spending and other state and local appropriations for water quality and habitat purposes. So we know this is, this is well written out. The membership voted on this and said, yes, we support a strong CRP element in the Farm Bill conservation title including but not limited to CRP reauthorization with an increased acreage cap, maintenance of continuous sign up for high value environmental practices such as buffer and wetland restorations, maintenance and expansion of the grassland program and removal of restrictions on incorporation of drainage water quality management practices while maintaining other successful programs such as EQIP and CSP. So at the time, what they were thinking about doing is throwing all of those kind of in one pot, I believe. Um, and they're saying, no, we've got, there's a role for both of these. So here's how I was able to use this very quickly. And I didn't need to consult anyone because it was on our books. This was right when Tina Smith um, got appointed um, as our state senator. And she had, she was doing, she was going around Minnesota and looking for feedback on the farm bill. And there was this on the, on the right side there, there was a questionnaire that she wanted folks to send out or to fill out and send to her um, uh, Senator uh, Smith's office. They called us, wanted to make sure that we were, that we had gotten the information. So the first question, what is the biggest change you wanna see in the farm bill? Um, and so I said what the what mod was, and then I was able to quote exactly what was in what was in the resolution that got written. It was a direct match. The next uh, question, what are we concerned about? We didn't have any policy on that, so I didn't uh, write anything there. What programs are working and why? Again, I was able to take uh, verbiage right in that original resolution and uh, get that submitted. And so when I did submit this, I called I called their office, said I'm submitting a, I'm submitting some comments, and I was able I uh, submitted both the resolution and our comments in the letter, and uh, they thanked us for that. So powerful ways that resolutions can work for our organization. So just a few tips for passage. Um, I know sometimes uh, folks sometimes get really angry when when their idea doesn't pass. So I thought it would be appropriate just to give you a few ideas. Um, promote your ideas with other watersheds. You should be absolutely work in the room when you get up to the mod convention, talking to folks about your about your resolution. See if they have any questions. Talk to them at your region meetings if if you're doing those. Call them up ahead of time. Make sure you're networking, making sure that if folks have questions or don't understand your resolution, that they get those answered. Another powerful thing is uh, talk to other entities who can be our key supporters, who we can work with to get this passed. 
give them your resolution say hey right soil and water conservation district do you think you could uh pass do you think you could submit this in your organization or um hey Stearns county can you do this also and, and network that way the more people we have on board um uh the better and then uh send send your ideas to others for review and feedback send it um or have somebody just read it who doesn't know what you do <laughs> and see if they if it if they understand it because it should be simple enough that a legislator could be able to read your page and uh, read through it and understand. So you might have to dumb it down a little bit. So um, uh, get get some feedback from others. It 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 certainly doesn't doesn't hurt. So that um, that's all I have on this. Hopefully you've uh, taken uh, away a few uh, tips and tricks and an understanding of uh, what we're doing here with the resolutions process. And if you have any questions, I would certainly um, be willing to answer them if I can. Does anyone have any questions or comments for Emily? Thank you, by the way, Emily. You're welcome. Okay, hearing none. Does anyone have any general comments or questions? Well, I wanna thank all of you for joining your fellow MOD members today. I think it's been a really great program and I know I've learned lots. As previously stated, the meeting is being recorded and it'll be posted next week. Please, please, please check out the committee section of the website and let Emily or let me know if you're interested in joining a committee. Be sure to watch your email for information on the annual meeting and that's December 1st through 4th at Arrowwood in Alexandria, Minnesota. And then mark your 22 calendars, your 2022, it's hard to even think that far. Um, now for next summer's, next year's summer tour, which I believe Sherry is June 22 through 24, right? That sounds right to me. Okay. And the only other thing I have to say is have a great summer. Emily, did you want to say something? Uh, just have one tiny little thing uh, to give a minute for folks to think about. Um, I had a call earlier this week about the, the convention. Now, you know, it's exciting that we have vaccines. And, um, but remember how close we're sitting next to each other. Um, so if you, if you have any thoughts about that, cause it, um, we have a higher risk group, of course, um, at times, and we don't necessarily have, we don't have full vaccination rates in the state of Minnesota. If you have, if that's going to impact whether you will come or not come, or if that's enough reason for you to get, uh, to get, uh, vaccinated, I certainly, um, uh, would encourage that my my mom's cousin actually ran the CDC um, uh, CDC under the George Bush administration and and she is a phenomenal woman and I would if she tells me to get a vaccine I get a vaccine uh, so <laughs> she said to do that so if if you have thoughts on that I hadn't thought about that about how close we I mean we almost sit on top of each other in some of those rooms so um, we're going to have to think about that as a board. I, sorry, I jumped this, uh, just throw this out at you right now, Mary, but uh, if we're going to, you know, how we're going to handle that, but it does worry me a little bit. Um, it's between Thanksgiving and, and uh, Christmas, of course, and, and uh, so uh, give that some thought, and if you have any ideas, uh, uh, certainly uh, let us know, or if it impacts your decision to attend, we'd like to know that, so. We certainly don't want a mod spike. No, <laughs> so, <laughs> that is not acceptable. Not the way um, we want turnover. <laughs> no, <laughs> not at all. <laughs> and actually, I think, you know, remember last year, I built um, the uh, Steve uh, Klein, um, who passed away right during that week. Um, that was COVID uh, related. So very sad. I don't want to lose any of you to that. So no, we've lost too many people. Well, thank you all very much. Have a great rest of your summer. And We'll see you in Alexandria. Thank Take you. care. Thank you.